really excited to have Juli Delgado Lopera here today with us to talk about their fiction. And my wonderful colleague, Rodrigo Lazo, is going to be introducing our author and talking about this work. Uh, so, Rodrigo, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you for enriching our cultural life. Um, thank you, uh, Julia, and thank you to Illuminations for sponsoring this event and making it happen. It's really uh, great to have um, uh, Huli joining us today. So um, a brief introduction. Um, first of all, hola mi gente, buenas tardes. Uh, it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome to UC Irvine, Huli Delgado Lopera, whose work challenges the, the boundaries of monolingualism. Aquí se habla español, none of that English only stuff. In 2020, Delgado published the novel Fiebre Tropical, which brings together a variety of pertinent concerns to our time, immigration, intergenerational relationships among women, how people respond to uh, various technologies within migrant contexts, questions of queer identities. And the novel does so in a language that is fearless in its intertwining of English and Spanish. And not just any Spanish, but one that calls on us to engage with Colombianismos, okay? Cachaco, bololo, bacano, full bacano, words that I had to learn. Reading Delgado aloud, la lengua tiene que bailar un merengue. With its sassy tone and bilingual turns, Fiebre Tropical has rightfully won several awards, including the Aspen, Aspen Literary Prize. Delgado has also published the books Quiereme and Cuéntamelo, the latter a bilingual collection of oral histories by LGBT Latinx immigrants, which won the 2018 Lambda Literary Award. To my mind, Delgado is moving Latinx literature in very interesting new directions. Uh, and it's uh, great that we have the opportunity for this conversation today. So today, Juli is gonna read for us um, and then we'll, we will move into conversation uh, questions from me, questions from the audience. Please ask your questions um, in the Q&A function. We'll um, uh, uh, take them. So um, uh, uh, welcome, Juli. Gracias, Rodrigo, for this introduction tan bella. Uh, hi, everybody. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here speaking with all of you. I can't see you, but I can kind of feel you, and I see your numbers, so I know you're there. Um, thank you so much, Julia and Rodrigo and everybody uh, from UC Irvine for putting this together. Um, it's such a joy to be able to speak to all of you um, because the book came out last year and, you know, we're in a pandemic. And so this is like the only way that I get to like speak to people. Um, so I'm hoping that we can have a really lively conversation. I love questions. I love engaging with the audience. And so, you know, please feel free to just like write down um, what comes to mind. So I'm going to start with a short reading of the book. Um, if you have it, it's going to be uh, chapter dos. And just, it's very short. Chapter dos. La Tata was obsessed with Don Francisco. Sao's Gigante was Jesus before Jesus was Jesus. Even before moving to Miami, Homegirl watching religiously every Saturday, mumbling amorcitos from her rocking chair to the television. Back in Colombia, Tata had visions where she stepped onto Don Francisco's set in a glorious dress, spun the magic wheel and won a car or a kitchen set or a vacation for two. She will hold my hand and say, I mean, me, they imagine you and I in a Disney world. Once in Miami, she called the 1-800 number several times, leaving detailed messages. Si niña, Alba, that is A-L-B-A. Si Alba, can you tell him to call me back? It's important. In Miami, the Galan dream was closed. So close was Tata to having the Chilean-born papi read her name tag, call her from the audience holding out his arm for her. Alba is la ganadora, he would say. Above everything, she wanted to be the winner of what? Of that moment of recognition of that spotlight of Don Francisco landing a faint kiss on her cheek. Tata would sit in the first row with the rest of the Cuban señoras, but she would be his favorite, the one with the special juju. She would have hung the photograph of Don Francisco with his arm around her next to her blessed woman of the year certificate from church. 
If the neighbor, neighbor IG and Papi called, she will wear the dark green dress and the only gold earring she still owns. She walked down the step like she once did at Club Union in Cartagena, sending kisses this way, kisses that way, but this time she will mean it. Pero niña, dime se tumba lo casco. Y ahí estamos, on the couch, watching some señora hold on Francisco's hand and win Tata's kitchen set. Mírala, Tata said, she doesn't even know how to spin the wheel. Mommy didn't understand how Tata prayed Jesucristo all day, then watched that low class crop where fake Cuban blondes with huge cleavage downs around El Chacal and gifted people slimy kisses, kitchen knives, and trips to Kisimi. And wasn't Tata supposed to be working in the arroz con coco? Didn't Tata understand that the baptism was happening soon? And mommy's hair needed two days of work, and nobody, and I mean nobody, was helping her. And why hasn't anyone checked their to-do list? Take it in. There are three baptisms to-do lists. Tata used her as a coaster. The other two were posted on the fridge. Each of our names double underlined. Lucia and Francisca. Not even Lucia finished her endless list, which included stuff like baptism playlist, baby crosses from the dollar store, and cleaning Sebastian's face con el laisol. All with a huge ojo scribble on each side, little eyes with eyelashes filling in both of the O's. We let mommy rant. I sat on the back on the couch popping her black heads from Tata's back. She paid me 25 cents to pop, money that never materialized, but I nonetheless sat every time she asked because I loved squeezing her back fat. I was the best chosen kid who got to squish my Tata's skin and liberate her from the horrors of black heads and pus. If she was tipsy enough, she let me draw on her back with a black pen, and I always did. Once, back in Colombia, as she undressed for a medical checkup, the doctors gasped in horror at the drawings of the headless zombie women eating their babies that I had meticulously traced on Tata's back. Nurses were instructed to clean her immediately before the traumatized doctor could continue touching Tata's heart. Mommy was still on the phone negotiating something or other. La Tata moved around, pulling at her dress, getting her round and white costeña as comfortable on the sofa. Pájaros tirándoles a las escopetas, Tata finally said. Abrata huevonada. Those people, she continued to mommy. A Jesús es hijos tú. Okay, and the arroz con coco will get done whenever the arroz con coco gets done. A una ni la dejan. She wouldn't drop it. I can't even watch Don Francisco in peace. No joda. And I'll stop right there. <laughs> All right. Did you um did you want to uh start with um any thoughts, Julie? Yeah, so I'll just start by saying that I'm an immigrant. I moved to the States uh when I was 15 and when I arrived here, I used to go to a bilingual school in Colombia. Um so I had like, you know, basic English. Um, and anybody who's learned a new language understands that it's very different to kind of learn the grammatical structure of a language than to actually go and like speak it. And so I knew how to say some things in English, um, but it was definitely a real challenge to get to this country. And I think that my passion for the ways that my grandmother, my aunts, and you know, I arrived in Miami first, and the way that people in Miami were mixing languages was really what called to me. Um, I would go to school and I would sit in English class and I was not doing good in like English or history class. Um, it was a real challenge to me. I used to write my essays phonetically in Spanish when I had to read them out loud because I was so scared of people making fun of me. Um, but then I would leave and I would arrive at my house, you know, and I grew up in a big matriarchy. And so I would hear my aunts trying to make sense of the world around them in English and like mispronouncing names that they had just learned. My grandmother saying everything phonetically um, and just kind of like picking things. And also on the streets of Miami, just listening to a lot of Cuban people say, you know, they llama patras o la cura. They call they say pesos instead of dollars, everything. And so it was just really interesting play of language um, that was really attractive to me. And I started writing a lot of the stuff down. Um, all of this to say that a lot of the the nourishment that I had as a storyteller, um, being an immigrant kid with my grandmother, and you know, further when I was in Colombia, I was I was, grew up around my aunts a lot, and so they would just all the time be like telling a lot of stories, and they come from the coast of Colombia, which is a place that it, 
you know, people make up a lot of words. And so all of this has like definitely nourished kind of like that storyteller in me. And when I started writing, I really, um, I was so attracted to this way of, 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 of talking and to this kind of slang, uh, but it was such a challenge to kind of like craft it into literature because literature is kind of seen as this high art. And so the, the whole premise of the book was kind of making space for my own linguistic reality. And that's, that's a, a lot of what fueled it. It was this passion that I had for spoken word that was just only spoken in those very margin spaces. Um, you know, like La Lavanderia, the little store, the, the, the food with your family, but I didn't really see it in high literature, but I was really attracted to it. So that's a lot of what fueled it is like this passion for just the way that immigrants create and mix new words in a way that is kind of sassy and humorous. Um, but you still are able to communicate because you understand what they're saying. And so that's a lot of like, just to give you all a little bit of a background, um, I've been now here in the States for 17 years, but even now, you know, like I, there's a lot of stuff in English that I don't understand, like a lot of humor stuff that just escapes me. <laughs> um, and I've just been really sitting with like writing from this intersection where I'm from because I had to learn English from the outside. I wasn't born into it and I didn't soak in the language, right? Like when you're born in a language, you kind of hear it and you soak in it. I didn't, I had to like see it from the outside, but also seeing it from the outside. Um, it's, it's great because I'm able to pull things that are gonna work for me. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to give you all a little bit of a background on like where the language comes from and like a little bit of like my own history as a storyteller. Um, and where that comes from. So that's beautiful because you've talked about um, the you I, I work in part challenges the centrality of English. So you're coming at it from the outside. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the Miami context because Miami is a city in this country where one can live in Spanish. You know, para la tienda, el banco, lo que sea. So there's a lot of Spanish that's circulating in that scene. So it's not like you were in an English only kind of area. Did that allow you to um, grow as a writer who could really combine the two languages so effectively as you did. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. I mean, Miami is such a wonderful place. It's so interesting because it's also just very conservative, but it's full of Latinos. Um, and it's it's the Latinidad of Miami is very different from like the West Coast Latinidad. You know, I do feel that the West Coast has a much more like um, like activist. There's a lot of like Chicano power. Like it just grows out of like this like Chicano movement kind of like feel. Whereas like Miami is very flashy. And that also, I, I feel like that also gives it like a different kind of aesthetic. Um, but yeah, I mean, we landed. So I wasn't in the Miami city proper. I was in the outskirts of Miami. And um, it was, um, Definitely, I did not have to speak English at all unless I was in school. Like there was nobody. I remember when I was in school in like 10th grade, I started writing down the friends that I had that spoke English because I had no friends that spoke any English. Um, and so definitely my world was a world of just Spanish speaking people. So we would go to like the stores where all the stores that were for Latinos. So like everybody speaks Spanish to you. Um, we would go to, and even the Walmart there, and the dollar store that my mom went to, Everybody was either Cuban, Venezuelan, or Colombian. Um, and so you don't really have to, but what happens is that the people that are there have also been learning Spanglish from their tias, from their primos. They, they got here like five years ago, so they're already saying like, peso, cuora, mami, bring me that. You know, so it's like, they're already playing with that. And I wasn't consciously being like, oh, this is so much fun. You know, I was a teenager, I had just arrived here and I hated everything. I was just pretty bored, but it was, I love reading a lot and I was really attracted to language and I thought it was really funny and like interesting the way that they were doing that. I wasn't just, I wasn't like, oh my God, I'm growing as a storyteller. I did, I wanted to go back to Colombia for the first, like for the entire time that I was living in Miami, I wanted to go back basically. But, um, but it was just, I noticed now in retrospect how much, all you know in the in the going to church with my mom because even church itself was playing in on in this English right because English was also giving you access to kind of like a sense of superiority I mean English is like the superior language as well and so like there was this really interesting way in which people play with English um and so I started realizing a little bit more of like the, the notion of hierarchies the notion of like who gets to talk and like I would see that for instance like my mom who was 
such so she's such a big character um because she didn't speak any english she was very much reduced um when we would go to a store or something like that because she couldn't like speak it and people would assume that she was um like dumb and so they would question kind of like her her intellectuality um but yeah it was it was it was uh, it was wonderful to be in Miami and I think that that's also why I kept my Spanish so intact for such a long time there's a lot of people that move young I, I was 15 then moved to other places where they're full of white people or like full of people who only speak English and so like you just kind of learn it and go with it I have a thick accent and I did not have to speak English until I got here to California uh 16 years ago 16, uh, 13 years ago when I came to Yeah, that, so that's fascinating. And I, um, I, hate to, I hate to do this because um, often writers don't want to be equated with their characters, but you've held that out for us in a way by um, giving us your trajectory to Miami um, and how that, when you said the, the teenager with a bad attitude, of course, Francisca <laughs> immediately comes to mind. In, our, in my class, we talked about Francisca rolling her eyes and the Kira shirts and all that. La vie, I love it when you call her, when they call her La Viuda, you know, that it, it's, it's, it's <laughs> hilarity to it. But can you talk a little bit about that, about your, your relationship to Francisca as a narrator and as a character in the book? Yeah, I mean, Francisca definitely grows out of a blueprint of my life. Like she grows out of memories that I've had. It's not me, but she grows out of the blueprint of a lot of stuff from my life a lot of memories that I have she's way smarter than me at 15 she's way sassier she understands what's going on and her commentary is just spot on um and that's not exactly how I was I was suffering when I was 15 because I hated everything and I was just very bored uh, most of the time when I first arrived here I was just really, really bored um but Francisca you know I took a lot of the memories that I had of being here and you know, the church was a very big part of transitioning into the U.S. My entire family was evangelical Christian. That's something that I did not have to experience in Bogota because Bogota is a city. And I was, run, you know, I was running around already at 15 in the city. Um, and my mom became an evangelical Christian when we moved to the States. And so that really marked me. And I wanted to explore a little bit of those memories that I had and, you know, like, her sexuality kind of comes up. My sexuality didn't really come up that early. Um, and she's actually able to follow a lot of her intuition, right? She still like follows Carmen. She still like does a lot of things like intuitively. And I did not sadly have like that level of like intuitive power that I think Francisca definitely has. And so it is like, it does come from a lot of the blueprint of my life and memories. And yet there's a lot of fictionalized memories and like there's a lot of imagination that came also into developing the character. Awesome. So I'm going to, um, we've got some questions coming up. So I'm going to try right. to get to um, uh, this one's from Bri uh, Brianna Pinan. Um, how did this journey of understanding your environment and the nuances and capabilities of language reflect in your writing process and your attempts to make room in your writing for the way you experience the world? a very sorted mix of both languages bleeding into another, one into the other. So, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a big question. I think that what, if, what I'm listening correctly is about process, right? Like how does all of this shape into, into process? I think it's a lot about noticing. It's about a lot of like self-awareness and that's something that I've been cultivating. Um, again, I just started really noticing what are the things that attracted me. And I was reading um, writers that were doing similar things. So I read Toni Morrison. I read Toni Morrison a lot um, in Spanish, like Pedro Lemebel, Rita Indiana, uh, Arundhati Roy. And so those writers that were also playing with things, I was reading just a lot of people who were doing things that really excited me. Um, and that also gave me ideas about craft as to how to craft my own slang. And so this, I took, it took a lot for me to craft a book written in Spanglish. Um, it, it was, there's a lot of intentionality in the way that the book is crafted. And I also got so many ideas about how to do it from other writers who had already previously done stuff like this. Um, including, you know, like major like Spanglish writers like Janine Capone, Juno Diaz. Um, that you know that have like Latino writers in the U.S. that are, have already been doing that before me. 
Um, and so in terms of the actual process, I have, I have a notebook with me always, and I'm always taking notes of like things that I found that just call on me. And sometimes it's not because I have a project going on or I have specific like end product for the word, but it's just, just the way because it excites me. And so, you know, if I'm in the buzz, I will write stuff down. I also have a queer mother who's a trans woman from Cuba and Caribbean people have the best Spanish. I think Caribbean people have the best, the most like musical and inventive. And I also have spent a lot of time with Caribbean people. So that's why, but she makes up so much stuff and I'm always writing stuff down. Um, so I just listen a lot. I love music. And so I think that I also have an ear with how phonetically things sound. Um, and that really attracts me the way that things sound like phonetics was definitely like a huge pull for me in the book. Um, and so when I was going to start writing, I would have my list of words next to it that I just like, you know, like Rodri was mentioning like bololo, animaleja, la vida. And I would just have it there and I would just like pull two or three and then just start from there and see where some of those words take me because that to me was the the deliciousness of writing, you know, was like discovering where each one of these words was going to take me in relationship to the narrative when I was doing my first draft. Mm -hmm. So um, Leah Jackson um, uh, wants to um, pick up on your reference to high literature. How do you think uh, Fiebre Tropical fits into that space? Um, uh, and, and also questioning the question of whether, or question whether uh, you can have value without necessarily being high literature. I was interested that your, the writers you're engaging with are, are prominent people. So um, let's talk a little bit about that, how, you know, this idea. Yeah. I mean, it's been, you know, here's the thing that's interesting is like the moment you have the New York Times saying something about you, then all of a sudden you move into that. So you still have <laughs> to get that kind of like institutionalized recognition, um, which is, you know, but I, I had so many obstacles along the way and so many people telling me, why are you, because I'm not like, I'm not only dropping Spanish words. I'm literally like create like I know that I'm building a lot on the Spanglish and I know that I'm putting in a lot of stuff that if you don't speak Spanish, you don't understand. Like I'm fully aware of this. Um and so it's it's an interesting conversation. I'm not sure if I have made it to like the the high literature. I definitely think that the book has getting recognition and therefore people are taking the Spanglish itself more seriously, right? But you still need that backing of a big institution to affirm that what you're doing linguistically like can take up space. And that's the way that we exist, right? Like we, we need those things. Um, and so it's a really interesting conversation in, in the way that languages get legitimized, like who can legitimize a language. Um, and so in this case, I've been just like, you know, like lucky enough that some people in like prominent positions have really taken an interest in the book and have made space for this kind of slang to exist. So it's it's open up conversations about like, you know, like higher literature. But I something that I talk about a lot is how Spanglish is able to exist in non-threatening non spaces. So what I'm calling non-threatening spaces is like, you know, your abuela's house, la lavandería, tío's tacos, Shakira says some words in Spanish, you know, this kind of like little like artsy, like non-threatening spaces, but literature is seen as the high art of language. And so that is, there's way more gatekeeping into that. And even in the, in the journey of publishing the book, I got so much pushback from editors, from agents, um, precisely because of the Spanish in the book and the Spanglish in the book, the play of both. And so it's, you know, it's an interesting conversation. And I do think that right now, because of the big shift in the conversation around like institutionalized racism that the Black Lives Matter movement has brought to the center stage in the US, a lot more people are having to have these conversations, including like institutions of literature. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I don't know if it has made it there or not. I just think that it's, it's open conversations for me um, and, and, I'm, and, I, and I welcome them and I welcome to be able to have these conversations around language, definitely. I'm fascinated by the pushback you got and the resistance to doing something that's creative and fresh and new and, and that it may not fit the kind of norms in some ways. I mean, it's what you're doing with language is what you're doing with a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. And so 
Um, I, was, I was wondering if you could address the question of audience, right? Because that's something that a publisher would look at and say, well, who's the audience for this book or who's gonna read that? Um, and, uh, and, you know, if you think of Latinx writers and people who are writing uh, either code switching or writing bilingually, um, there's often that question, are they writing for bilingual readers or for people who are reading predominantly in English and then can kind of, um, uh, you know, also get pick up on some of the Spanish. Are your, is your, do you think about those readers? Like, do you try, because some writers will try to, try, you know, offer like translations or things uh, when you're writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge question, right? Like the question of audience is really big because generally the audience is always assumed to be a white audience. Like it's an all like in like only like monolingual English speaking white audience. And that's that's basically a lot of the pushback that I got is like, this is not gonna fit in my inner audience. And I was like, who's your audience? <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, there's 50 million Latinos in the US. Who's your audience? Um, and not only that, Spanish is so widely spoken that like in California, a lot of people who are not from Latin American descent speak Spanish, like so many people. Um, and so it, it's really interesting because I do think that in it's still in literature, we assume that the audience is a monolingual English speaking white audience, basically. Um, I, when I started writing this, again, like I was just playing, I was just experimenting to see what I was doing. I didn't even start thinking that it was gonna be a book. It was a short story. It grew out to be a novella. And then I was like, oh my God, this is growing into a novel. But I didn't think about that. I was just having a lot of fun trying to experiment with how far I could take storytelling, doing this kind of playfulness with both languages. And, and, and you know, like writing the story that just like grew, the characters started growing more and more. Um, so, you know, like that's, that's where it started. And then, then I started thinking about audience when a lot of the voice was already developed. So the voice, I didn't think about the audience when I was developing the voice, it came after. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, I was just like considering how many um, Latin American people there are in the US, how many people um, really like are interested even in just like, like being uncomfortable. You know, I think the book is also an, an invitation to be uncomfortable with stuff that you don't know. Um, and to like being able to like sit with like the unknown. Um, there's a lot of, the, of English that I don't understand. You know, like this book was written for me, definitely for people like me who are, like exist in both worlds and would like just like, like swim in it. And there's so many people that like don't, that still understand it. Maybe they're sw not swimming it. There's some people that understand some, and there's some people that are just like, hmm, don't understand anything of the Spanish, but they can still go through it. And it's also, it is an invitation to be uncomfortable, to sit with what it feels like to like have all this like language gap. And I didn't necessarily set out to like mimic some of the immigrant experience, but it is kind of that, you know, like I've been living in this country 17 years and to this day, I don't understand everything. I read a book and I'm still, and I'm a writer, you know, I read a lot. I read a book and I still am at odds sometimes with some of the stuff that is being, that is there, but it's an invitation for me to learn. And this is also an invitation to learn. It's like, maybe it wasn't tailored specifically to you, but just like, you know, be open to sitting with what's uncomfortable um, and to not having everything so tailored. And so that, that's a thing where it is for me, it's also being able to shift the default of the audience from a white audience to this audience that exists more on the margins. And I don't think that it's only Latinos who are called to this book. I mean, I've had people who are just immigrants in general, you know, whose parents speak both languages in the house and they're like excited about seeing this. Also, we live in a world that has growing diasporas all over the world, right? People are moving and there's growing diasporas all over the world. And so a lot of this mixing of languages and this intersection of languages, it's all something that is happening where we want, want it or not. Like people can keep pushing back, but there's people who are mixing Turkish with French and Spanish, you know, like they're just, things are happening and they're happening in homes and they're happening on the streets. And I just happened to pick up on the specific um, phenomenon that um, really interests and, and really interests me. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the amazing parts of the book is that even for those of us who are um, uh, fluent Spanish speakers, it's still less, Unless you can really pick up both the Colombianismos and the and the Spanish, you all of us are forced in some in some ways to go uh, 
to go, you know, trying to decipher language. So I like how you created that space even for bi bi bilingual readers. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can get another question. You guys keep uh, posting your uh, questions um, in the Q&A here. Um, uh, uh, so um, Daniel Pacheco says, for the children of Latin American immigrants, a lot of our exposure to Spanish is by learning Spanglish. And that's usually looked down on because it isn't considered proper. What are your thoughts on the stigma that it carries? And do you have any advice for overcoming it? Excellent question. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And I understand now because I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't born here. So of course I have a very different relationship to the language and I have a very different relationship to the Spanish. Um, and it means something very different to me. I, I mean, I think that it's fucked up that people are forced to assimilate. I think that it's messed up that people cannot just develop their own sense of language. I think that what I, the shame that exists has a lot to do with um, the colonial power that English has just really like the, the, the pressure um, to, to assimilate and the feeling that like Spanish is seen as like an inferior language. I also understand that there's a lot of people who speak um, Spanish, they're second generation or third generation, and they speak Spanish very differently, or they only speak Spanish like from the house, from their grandmothers, from their moms. And so I think that that's, I think that definitely like sitting with what it means to you and what relationships you have to that language. And if it's important to you, then just like keep it going with whatever it is. I mean, you're, I think that if we're waiting for the mainstream to like give us permission, that's never gonna happen. So like, don't wait for anybody to give you permission to have the relationship with language that you want to have. Like that relationship is yours and that relationship speaks to your own history with that language, right? Like it speaks to like either your grandmother or your parents coming to this country. It speaks to like that ancestral lineage that you have and this is where you have from it. And so like, I think that is definitely about feeling confident with yourself and like working on your own self love with that relationship um, instead of like waiting for like an other to like, you know, approve because people are, people are not going to approve in general. Everybody's going to push back against everything, you know, and like just finding other folks who feel similar to you. Um, I know that there's a lot, especially if you're in California, there's so much work done around the Chicano movement. And basically a, a lot of the stuff that that you're bringing up is, is very much talked in, you know, Cherry Moraga, Gloria Saldua kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, just that's your relationship with your own language, that's your relationship with your lineage and just maybe excavating a little bit more of that, what it means to you, where it comes from and just like digging deeper um, instead of like worrying about like what, what the other is like saying and how the other is reacting, just like maybe digging deeper for yourself um, into that relationship. So um, uh, picking up on that question of um, Ansaldua there, um, one of my students had this great, made a great, a great connection between the moment in your TED talk and those of you who haven't seen her TED Talk, go to it. It's on YouTube, um, uh, The Poetry of Everyday Life. Um, the, uh, there you talk about shifting your tongue to try to pronounce uh, the words coming out of Romeo and Juliet when you had to read that in front of the class. And, um, uh, and then if you think about Ansel Dewey's How to Tame a Wild Tongue and this whole question of tongues. And so uh, that was a great connection because I do see you very much, um, this is just my perspective, picking up on uh, also, and so there was project of really kind of complicating the divisions, the separations, um, and uh, on many fronts, right, where there's questions of identities or language. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you said it, I think that um, she is huge. She's super influential in my work, too, because she paved the road for people like me to be able to exist. Um, when people talk about Spanglish being something new, just like, oh, you're doing this really cool thing. I'm like, no, people have been doing this for a really, really long time. Um, especially somebody like her who developed a theory in Spanglish, right? Like in this like Chicanismo, this Pochismo, all this stuff. Like, again, like she turned that shame that was coming from like the other into her own power. And she just, you know, she, she turned it around and, um, talked a lot about like assimilation and like even being hit for speaking Spanish. And so these are the people, these are kind of like our language ancestors um, who were who were like 
set the lineage and like set the space for like people like me to be able to today like publish something um, because she did a lot of that work beforehand. So definitely I'm building on, um, definitely I'm building on the stuff that um, she was doing for sure. A couple of the questions want to go back to this, the, the pushback that you uh, got from, from mm -hmm. the publishers uh, for um, Emily Garcia Valle, for example, writes, how were you able to overcome this pushback? Uh, and did you have to make compromises or unwanted edits to overcome it? I think that's definitely in line with what you're saying. On the one hand, you have Ansel Dua and others opening that way. But on the other hand, there's this publishing industry that still has uh, certain um, uh, more monolingual expectations. So how, you know, how did you respond to that? It's, uh... Yeah, I mean, I want to also like say that it's, it's monolingual and it's also the expectation that the Spanish comes italicized or that it comes translated. So again, like, you know, it's like, who is the imagined audience in there? Um, I, th that was why it took me a second to like, look for a publisher for the book and um i had a lot of people who were initially interested and then would just kind of like drop the ball because they didn't know where to place it the audience wasn't right and so when i finally talked to the editor of the feminist press i was like look the non-negotiable thing is the spanglish in it and i want like i wanted to get feedback about my craft not about like your anxieties <laughs> not about your like xenophobic anxieties around like the changing in demographics and therefore the changing in language um <laughs> which that's what it is to me is like there's a lot of anxiety around the big change in demographic that's happening in this country and therefore the change in in a lot of things including language and so the the people who published it just like the feminist press are wonderful i mean they're incredible and she really understood what i was trying to do and so like our conversations around the book were all around craft and by this i mean like character development like plot points like you know like developing like scenes more setting but not you know like why are you including the spanish word here like that, that, that was irrelevant. That was part of like the voice of the book. Um, like she wasn't asking me to like tame it down or, and that's really what I wanted. And so the, the, the lesson basically is, you know, like you really have to listen to the people who actually like understand your vision. And there was a lot of work that I did on the book. It wasn't that like, it was just like, this is it. No, we did a lot of work on it, but she understood that Spanglish was craft. You know, it wasn't something to be fixed and it wasn't something that needed, you know, it was it was craft and we talked about it from that, that point of view and that just made me feel like she understood my vision for my work. Awesome. So um, shifting a little bit toward uh, back, back to Fiebre Tropical. Um, uh, actually, let me let me. This was a question that came up in the chat before we get to this more specific one. Uh, somebody wanted to know about the title. Um, Fiebre Tropical, um, uh, it's, it's also uh, included in the novel. How did you use the title and what is the significance of that phrase for you? <laughs> well, the title, um, I connected to water in the novel. So it has a lot to do with the big rain that's coming and also tied to the fact that Francisca can't cry. Um, so there's all this stuff around like, you know, the rain being really intense and the rain in the Caribbean is really, really intense. And in Miami, it's the hurricanes. And excuse me, and it was my first time experiencing hurricanes and it was Francisco's first time experiencing like the level of rain because um, it's also humid. And, and Bogotá, it rains a lot, but it's not humid. So it had to do a lot to do with water um, and the shift of weather and also her internal kind of like turmoil that kept building up and it didn't explode until the final scene where she's actually able to cry. Um, the title actually comes from, from a day that I was here in a party and there was this like DJ from Mexico who had this um, like Virgen de Guadalupe in the back and was playing some like cumbia. And the song was something about like, um, was something about like a tormenta tropical and stuff like that. And I was like, man, that sounds so good. So I was partying when I came up with it. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to connect it like this. <laughs> so you never know, you know, always carry notes. Because you never know when it's going to come up. But yeah, I was dancing to Cumbia um, at this little place here, which no longer exists in the Elbow Room in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. This is like little like underground Cumbia party. 
That's awesome. That's a good, that's a great story. Um, uh, the, well, let's talk about the other fievre part of the book, which is uh, mm -hmm. Francisca's own kind of like growth as a person, you know, moving in some different directions. And um, uh, so one of one of the responses that I have heard is um, about Francisca's struggle with sexuality in the face of her family's uh, church and the cultural norms. And for some uh, readers, that that's a little bit disturbing. And so uh what was it uh one of my students wanted to know was it difficult for you emotionally to write about that that particular aspect of 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 her own experience i mean i think the whole book was like a challenge to write in general um because i tried to understand a lot of stuff also about my mom being so incredibly christian um the part about the sexuality was actually a joy for me to write because it was a way for me to explore the insidiousness of desire. And so she never actually calls herself a lesbian. She never says the word gay, nothing like that happens. And so it was actually a really interesting experiment for me to figure out, especially because of a Latino family that like, you know, but you don't want to know. So everything is like, just like said through gestures and through silences. And I come very much from a place like that where like silence means a lot, gestures mean a lot, certain words that like opaque the meaning, you know, mean a lot. And so it was, my approach to it was more of um, being interested in just like, how do I express this desire without calling it like a gay? Cause now, you know, we, now gayness is so like, whatever, like everybody's gay. And so like, it's not a thing, but, but it's like, how do you, how do you explore? How do you explore that? And, and also like with the grandmother, it's like, how do you even articulate something that you have no words for? How does that exist in the body? How does that exist in terms of like gesturing and all that? So that was really interesting to me. The novel as a whole was a challenge to write because there was a lot of stuff that is, you know, that I was, I was thinking about and I was relieving a lot of the time at the church, which was incredibly challenging. Um, but I never fell in love with the pastor's daughter. There wasn't a pastor's daughter I was in love <laughs> with, sadly. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's both. It was like the, the, the novel, I think that, I think that literary work in general, like it was, has been my experience that writing uh, fiction is just draining and it's like, it's a lot, you put a lot of everything and even if uh, there's a lot of imaginative it's just like it's very emotional and it's very draining yeah i i, I love this scene in the book when la tata when you go back and write her historical her history in the 50s and there's that amazing scene at the end where she's looking at the nun and it's so full of desire and but it's not based on categories it's like you know we were talking about that how that doesn't mean that la tata is X or or anything. I mean, it's just, it's a moment of desire in which she wants, she's, you know, uh, wanting to touch, wanting to connect in some ways, but um, it's not necessarily putting her into a particular identity at that particular moment. Yeah, I mean, and that's also what I'm interested in. It's like right now we exist and the claiming, which is, you know, it's very useful to like use identities and, and, and like claiming of identities. And like, I just wanted to explore just like desire and that insidiousness. And also because like, I am the first like out person in my family. I know there has to be way more gay people before me, but like nobody, nobody ever like actually like went with it. <laughs> and so I just wanted to just like explore that desire in a way that it's not fully articulated in a way that does not have anything to do with an identity. It's just like this feel, um, and how that translates into like, you know, how do you do that in, in language? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really enjoy writing like Tata's moment um, with the nun, definitely. And, you know, she also has that like a little bit of a repressed desire. I mean, she really doesn't like men. That doesn't mean that she likes women. But she had that moment of like, you know, intense desire that she just, she didn't know what to do with. So would you then say if, um, if, if there are these moments um, that, the character in the book who, and this is from Diana Kuna asking this, that the character who does get kind of pushed by the uh, uh, the influence of the church is Car Carmen, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, pushed into a heteronormative sexuality because of the religion. I mean, is that what we're seeing there at the end? I think, I mean, Carmen is a complicated character because 
she wants so much to be part of the church. I mean, she, she like fully believes in that. And as someone who has been in a Christian church, I've seen that. <laughs> and it's like, just like people who fully, fully, fully believe the church is like their path and everything that is there. And I, and I really wanted to bring that girl of the church to life. Like that girl that I, I met and by that, I just mean like, you know, the, the archetype of the girl. Um, and you know, Carmen, there's all these moments where she definitely is there with Francisca, right? Like she's definitely there sharing all this intimacy with her. She's able to like push the boundaries of some of this, but then it becomes too much for her. And I think that for me was when I was writing, it was also just speaking about just like fear, you know, and like being able to just move into something that is just like more comfortable and like what she said to do. I mean, the church is such a huge part of her, but she could not allow herself to even open that door a little bit. I mean, Carmen is incredibly sad and disappointing. You know, she does not open the door at all. And like, we all want her to, I mean, I wanted her to, but she didn't, you know, she was just like, no, I'm just going to go. And, and her leaving was also a way to just further um, make her this very goddess like mythological creature for Francisca and to intensify that love because now she's even far away. So like, it's just even grander. Um, so it's, you know, it's a lot of like exploring queer desire in a way that it's not, you know, it's not fully sex, it's not fully like parties. It's just like this very insidious, um, this very insidious way, but she ends up just giving in into being what she was set to do. Um, which is, you know, like a pastor's girl who's now like fully, and also like Colombian girls also get a lot of plastic surgery, sadly. It's a stereotype, but it's also true. And so, you know, she went back to Colombia and she got some plastic surgery and she comes back just like not even recognizable. Yeah. All right. We're, um, we have time for some other questions. Let me see if I can. Um, so N Natalie Bonilla asked, what is the role of Colorism. Uh, in the book, uh, Carmen seems to receive discrimination from other characters throughout the novel because of her darker skin color and attraction also, right? So. Carmen seems to receive discrimination. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely uh, a role of um, racism and colorism in, in the book. Um, she, like Xiomara, who is Wilson's mom, it like pulls um, Francisca aside and it's like, I want you to like, you know, get him with my, with my boy. Like, I don't want him dating this like dark skin girl. Um, so there's definitely all of that there because all of that like truly exists. And like part of the book was trying to make immigrants into like full human beings and full complex human beings and not like exceptional or respectable. Like there's a lot of racism. There's a lot of like, you know, like, like white supremacy in like Latin American communities and that works itself out in this like, again, like this very insidious ways. Um, and, you know, like that's that like, and, and also like, even when you go back to look at mommy's story, like there's a, there's a moment where like Milagros is hanging out with like a boy who's like from a, from a lower background and he's also darker. And so there's like a thing happening also because of that. And so, there's there's all these ways that like race is coming in and out um, of the book because everybody every because they all hold a very different place because of how they look like that's just that's just the reality of it and so I wanted the I wanted the characters to be full on human beings and to be complex and to be fucked up basically to be able to fail and to be able to not be just like one dimensional, like, you know, good issues immigrants who all love each other because that's not really I wanted the bad people to be immigrants too. I want immigrants to be able to be evil in literature, you know, like we are held to such a high standard. We have to like follow this specific narrative for our humanity to be recognized. And, you know, like we also fail and we're also complex human beings. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of racism. You, you picked up on it and it's there. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, I think along that line, it's um, Im important to note that um, your your book also presents a, a, a type of immigrant experience that a lot of us in California um, uh, aren't always familiar with, which is uh, Latin Americans who have the resources to be able to take a plane to Miami as opposed to, you know, a lot of the news coverage here is about the people crossing. There's this, almost this assumption that everybody who's an immigrant is 
crossing the border as an undocumented person, but it's actually much more complicated than that. And I thought that was one of the things that's so fascinating about your book is how it's tracing a certain kind of class dimension in Bogota and then transferring that to Miami and the kind of uh, uh, associations that come with Miami as the, the capital of, of, of a particular way of thinking, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we are, we are you're, I mean, you're right. We are very much perceived as a homogeneous category and, um, and the assumption that we that there's like just one immigrant narrative and usually is the people who are across the border and there's a lot of people who have that story. Um, there's other immigrants who exist differently and I think that the conversation around class is just not really the, people don't talk about class in the US, first of all. Like it's something that people don't really discuss and class is a huge issue in Colombia and it's a huge issue in Latin America. And it's a huge issue in the book because the family, the mom comes from, she's, she comes from a more comfortable class and then she has, she loses it when she gets to Miami, she loses that. And she's trying to hold on to these little beats of moments that she still has a class, but she's, you know, now she's like hella work, working class and she's like working at a factory. Um, but she comes from like a, dis, a different place. And so I, I, I definitely wanted to bring in that dimension of class and also the level of classism that exists um, that is also re in relationship to race to um, in a place like Colombia, which is extremely classist. Um, and kind of like that translation of that into migrating to a place like the US where you're no longer um, the dominating class, but rather now you're working class and you know, like all these different things are, ch are shifting for you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I took on a different narratives for, for immigration because I also met a lot of people in Miami who, who had that story, you know, like a lot of people who arrived from Venezuela or Argentina or Colombia and they sold everything and now they went and worked at a 7-Eleven, you know, and they had been like lawyers or something. And so it changes a lot of stuff. I mean, it does. Um, but you also bring in all your like structures of like your structures of class that you that you have from Latin America, you bring them in the US and then they take they take like a kind of like a different shape. You know, that's what there's also this like reverence to like the gringo. It's like, you know, because you still have those like structures of class and of race that you bring from Latin America with you. All right, Huli, last question. Um, we're starting to run out of time. Um, so uh, when we, people first started using Latinx, um, I was among those who was kind of skeptical, one more naming game, you know, it's, uh, but I've increasingly become interested as a way to um, promote a certain way of thinking of a, a project that's uh, a little bit, you know, asks us to really rethink certain things. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Would you like it? Not like, no, it's a big debate. Some people want to use it, some people don't. Latin X, what do you think about the X? I mean, I, I don't use it that much. I've used it. Um, I think it's mostly because I call myself Colombian a lot here because I like claiming my place of birth and where I grew up. I I believe that it has a lot to do with like a younger generation of Latinos being able to call on that and being able to call on that experience of being also a kid of the internet um, and also a person who understands the, the infinity of gender. And so I like the X because it opens up that, um, it opens up Spanish and its genderness and it kind of like takes that out, right? Like it, you, it uses like um, a Spanish base um, and, but, it, but it moves it beyond the gender stuff. And I do think that it has a lot to do with people who are younger, who are also uh, people like kids of the internet. And, um, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it creates kind of like a, this dimension of struggle that is new right? That is the classic like, different kind of awareness. Like I think the Latinx, it comes with like a different sense of like a social justice awareness and it's calling on that, that specificity of the time period that we're in. Um, for me, it's more that like, you know, if people are resonating with it and it's something that like a lot of people really want, then like I love to just like hear people who like really, really feels really true to them. Um, I like, I like the X, the possibilities with the X are, are wonderful because Spanish is such a gender language that like, you know, I, I see a lot of a lot of people who use it that are aware of like trans people and like people who are non-binary and like the idea of being able to open that up. Um, and so, you know, I, 
I love that people are just generating new language for themselves and see like see where that goes and see if it sticks or not. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for this amazing conversation. Wonderful. And thanks, yes. Thanks to all of you who came today. And if you don't have it, get a copy of Fiebre Tropical. It's an amazing book. Uh, and this has been um, a, a really, really great conversation. Thank you for your generosity and taking all these questions and addressing these yeah. issues about thank your you life. Thank you so much writing. for having me. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Uh, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, and everybody at UC Irvine for organizing this and all you all for showing up. Um, this is part of the deal, right? Like being able to show up. So like, I'm extremely grateful to be able to be in dialogue with all of you. Um, and, you know, reach out. I also have a website and I have an Instagram, which is at Juliana de Lopera. And, you know, if you want to keep talking or just follow other stuff that I'm doing, definitely reach out. Thank you.